<laughs> Chris. <laughs> A-Hole Productions. Agents, I don't have a lot of time. Nemesis is coming. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my commentary track slash podcast, however you want to listen to it, for the Resident Evil second movie called Resident Evil Apocalypse. Uh, this is arguably one of the worst movies <laughs> that exists <laughs> that has zombies in it. Um, although there's, way, of course, there's way worse. I'll have some positives to say about this movie, but this is definitely where the franchise lost me. The first movie, I was kind of on board. I was like, all right, I like 60% like this and 40% don't like this. Um, and uh, and then this came out and I was like, okay, I'm really not liking where they're going with this franchise. I hope it gets better from here. And it, it doesn't. I think the third movie goes up a little bit, uh, just a tiny bit. Um, and then the fourth movie is so schlocky that I I kind of like certain scenes in it. And you'll get, we'll get into that as we do the commentaries for all these movies. Um, the fifth movie, I think, is awful. It's definitely worse than this movie. And the sixth movie is might be my least favorite movie I've ever seen in my life, uh, especially when you consider how awful Paul Anderson is at uh, storytelling and how awful the editor is at editing in that movie <laughs> and how awful everything was shot. Um, I'm actually surprised because I usually credit Paul Anderson, uh, Paul W.S. Anderson, uh, for who directed the first Resident Evil movie, and then he directed 4, 5, and 6. And I normally credit him for being a competent director as far as, you know, he comes in under budget, things look visually interesting sometimes, he pulls a lot of, uh, you know, visual references from, you know, Escape from New York and, and, uh, and, and the, like, the Omega Man and, and just movies that I like growing up. And so I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of get his aesthetic. I kind of like that. But I really wish someone else wrote these movies. He actually wrote all six of these movies, or at least a, a major draft of all six of these movies and yet he cannot even remember what he wrote in the previous movie so every movie contradicts the movie before it and it's so awful and by the time you get to the sixth one it just like they just wreck it's almost like they retcon all five movies but still reference them at the same time and it makes no sense you're like wait how are you telling me like hey look reference and like oh yeah that happened in that movie and then you retconned it and you're like in the in the same breath it, it's the the talent this man has to be this crappy of a storyteller, especially in the sixth movie, is outstanding, and we'll get there. But for today, we're going to talk about a movie that isn't as bad. It's not great, but I definitely, it really made me concerned about this movie franchise when I saw this in a theater. And I ultimately don't like this movie. Um, it's definitely like a, it got a 20% on Rotten Tomatoes, and I feel like that's pretty accurate. Like, I feel like it deserves a 20%. That's probably my rating for it, is 20%. Um, it's directed by Alexander Witt who was a second unit director, I believe, on Black Hawk Down. I've, I've seen his name in numerous credits before leading up to this, so I kind of thought, hey, maybe this guy will bring something to it. He's a, an, a, usually a second unit director on action movies. So I thought, okay, well, it's going to have more action in it for sure than so less horror, so I hope he does it justice. Um, he does not. I think this movie is, is pretty terrible. And from what I understand, uh, Mila Jovovich ADR'd her entire, the entire movie. She, she came in to do a couple ADR lines, um, and then she heard her voice, and I guess in the original cut, she just talked like Miljovic. She didn't, like, darken her voice, which you hear later. Like, because I guess she came in to do ADR for the opening, um, you know, moments of this movie. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second when I start the movie. But uh, I guess she came in to ADR that opening narration and decided at that point that Alice was going to sound deeper and darker and then watched, proceeded to watch scenes in the movie where she sounded like Mila, and she was like really upbeat, like her voice didn't sound as brooding, and she was like, "No, we got to ADR the whole movie." So I can only imagine being in that sound booth when she said that and being like, "F my life," uh, because that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work on her, but it's a lot of work on everybody else, and it's also the studio has to approve that and pay for it, and so I can only imagine. Um, so, uh, so. Anyway, so yeah, nothing like finding your character during the ADR session, right? Uh, that just shows you that Alice is not a character, and we'll go through that when we when we talk about this movie as well. Uh, they, I love how they like. I love Mila; she's great. She's a great actress. I've seen her in other movies where she's really fantastic, um, and and does really good dramatic stuff. But in these movies, she's terrible, and I and I blame a little bit on the director on that one, which is her husband in the first movie in four, five and six. But in this movie, I'm going to blame Alexander Witt as well um, because they just can't seem to 
get a grasp of this character. She's just whatever the t story needs. That's her character. We need a superhero. We need a superhero in this scene. Okay, she's got superpowers out of nowhere. Um, okay, we need her to do this in this scene. Okay, well she's gonna do that. We need someone to, you know, put their arm around the little girl in this scene. Okay, we're gonna do that. It's like, well, you have other characters in this movie, <laughs> and you're gonna see in this one especially. Alice does everything, and everybody else is useless. And that is the actual definition of what a Mary Sue is in a movie. And that is not a term I like to use, especially in a negative way, um, especially if towards someone who is as talented as Mila is. But that's how I feel about this character. There is nothing to the Alice character. And uh, and you're going to find out more about that as we talk about this movie. So without further ado, if you have the DVD or Blu-ray, I have the Blu-ray here. Uh, I'm on the main menu. I'm going to hit play. It's going to take a, a few seconds before it you know goes. Um, but uh, if you're ready, put your hand on the play button and get ready to press it in three, two, one. All right, screen went black and we are moving into the film now. It's rated R for nonstop violence, language, and some nudity. <laughs> nonstop violence. That's Resident Evil to a T, nonstop violence. When you play those games, there's never moments of quiet or ambient sound or anything like that. It's just nonstop violence. Uh, yeah. Uh, all the warnings and, and don't rip this movie, all that stuff. And don't rip movies. Don't be those people that watch torrents and stuff. Don't be like that. Support the entertainment industry. Um, or support things you like, at least. If you see a movie and you're like, hey, that looks good. Pay for it and watch it because a lot of people work hard on those movies. Um, I used to be a PA and a production coordinator and a production manager and um, a best boy and uh, lighting and grip. And I've, I've done a lot of stuff in movies and it's they're thankless jobs a lot of times. And uh, and when movies don't make money, then a lot of times people don't get called back to work on other things. Um, so Davis Film, Impact Canada, those are the logos that just came up. So hopefully that's timed with yours. Constantin Film, which is the uh, awful company that owns the rights to Resident Evil. When they first got it, I think they were going to do something with um, George Romero, and then that fell through. And then they gave it to Paul W. Sanderson. Paul W. Sanderson is one of those people that proves to me that when someone says, oh, I'm a diehard fan of something, I want to make the movie. He's proof that you should not give a movie to a diehard fan. Um I know there are examples of diehard fans that should get movies uh, that they love because they treat it with respect, but I don't. I, Paul W. Sanderson is he? It's weird. He overthinks very interesting aspects of the game and is like, "This has to be in the movie. This has to be in the movie." And then, but no, but character development and characters and actual plot. Uh, for some reason, aren't important to put in his movie, and I think that's really weird. So he's just all about fan service in a way with no substance and nothing's earned. And that's how I feel about his movies. So anyway, we have the scene here where Mila's doing the opening narration. You're seeing clips from the first movie. They do this in a lot of the movies. They have after the first one. Now that now that we're in the second one, they have Mila. Cause I like the first movie where it opens up and you hear, um, I think it's uh, Jason Isaac's voice and, uh, who is credited in the movie as Dr. Birkin in the first movie. And you're hearing him right now. We're reopening the hive. Uh, that's Jason Isaacs, but he was never in any of these movies. I don't know why Paul Anderson couldn't expand on his character. But originally, this movie was going to have Doctor Birkin as the villain, I believe. So these these are one of those movies too, where like you hear about, like that proves Paul Anderson is just a yes man, um, which is fine. Like st studios love yes men. Um, oh, yeah, they have this news reporter on. She's talking about the weather. She's going to be a character that pops up later on. Um, so I kind of like this setup. They kind of really establish Raccoon City. They show you the suburbs. They show you the city. They, you know, I think it's actually uh, Vancouver. <laughs> so it's like it looks nothing like the American Midwest, kind of. Um, although Paul Anderson will argue and says say that it does, but I don't really feel like it does too much. I mean, this part a little bit when the girls run in jogging and there's like a sprinkler in the yard. I'm like, eh, okay, that a little bit. Um, but yeah, he's just like, I think he's one of those directors that they go, Hey, in your script, you wrote this, this, and this, and you also, uh, want to film here, here, and here, and we can't make any of that happen. And then he just goes, okay, <laughs> like, right. That's what it seems like to me. Uh, cause, cause, cause otherwise I feel like these movies would be mo more coherent. 
Um, this part right here where they reopen the hive is so dumb. Um, it it, it kind of matches the walls match from the first movie, but they, they tore down all the sets and they filmed in Germany in the first movie. So when they're in Vancouver in this movie, uh, they're like, uh, oh, crap, we got to we got to rebuild everything. So they looked at like examples and, and, you know, they watched the first movie over and over and looked at the, the schematics or whatever. And, uh, and they had to rebuild this set for this one scene, but that doorway was nowhere to be found in the first movie. So there's, you know, but who cares about continuity? Right. Um, I mean, again, sometimes it's unavoidable. So that one, I'll give them a little bit of credit on. They had to rebuild that set from scratch. Uh, Ravensgate bridge, uh, is it just popped up on screen. I'm just making sure you guys are on the same point I am in the movie. Uh, from here on out, we should be good. So so this whole scene is neat. It's like all these black Umbrella SUVs driving in and picking up key members of Umbrella. It's so funny because when you get to the sixth movie, all the key members of Umbrella uh, that really matter are underground in storage containers like cryo tubes. So now this movie makes no sense because <laughs> why would Dr. Ashford be on land? He's a level six employee. Um, and I think the only thing higher than that's level seven, I think. And that's it. I don't think there's anything, any levels higher than that, as far as I remember. Um, so Dr. Ashford here is named after a character um, from Code Veronica, the Ashford family. They were... Um, they were the financiers in a lot of ways for the Umbrella Corporation, and they had a stake in it, and they had a seat on the board, I believe. Um, there was a, a grandfather, and then his son, uh, Ashford, I can't remember their first names, not Thomas, although Thomas might have been one of them. Um, Veronica was the original Ashford that rose them into um, into like one percenters that you know had a ton of money, and then they decided to back Oswell E. Spencer, when he created the Umbrella Corporation, he was like, I need funding. And they're like, okay, but we want a stake in it. And we also want to use your architect, George Trevor, who designed your mansion. We want to use him to design some stuff for us at our um, Rockford Island facility, which, uh, or not uh, the Antarctic facility, which he did. And he basically just c copied the, the main room from the Res Evil Mansion from the Spencer Estates. Um, so, so yeah, the, so the car flipped over, little girl got hit. Uh, they set up that Angie Ashford is the little girl. Again, these are not names from the movie, uh, from the game. They're just made up names for the movie. Um, Marcus uh, Ashford and Angie Ashford are not the names of the characters from the game. Um, it's Alexia and Alfred are the twins in the game. All right, so now we're getting introduced to Jill. You're seeing like her, she's turning on the radio. She's got a Raccoon City phone book that has the Umbrella logo on it. So it just shows you, I like all that. That's storytelling. That shows you how much Umbrella has their hand on Raccoon City. It's it's minor, but there, those details are important. So I'll give the, the team credit for that in those shots. Um, but basically, I think the idea here, she has a chalice, which is, they're just random. Um, I think they're saying it's from the Spencer Estates. There's a newspaper that came out as promotional material for this movie. That said, Jill Valentine and members of Stars were sent into the Arclay Mountains, into the mansion, which I guess is the mansion that uh, that Alice was in in the first movie. And I guess they sent her and her team in, and everyone got killed, but except for Jill. And that was like something that's in the the newspaper, promotional newspaper. And there's Mike Epps. Uh, Mike Epps once hit my car with his car, uh, and <laughs> in, in LA. I think I just moved to LA and I think I was there for a couple months and then uh, I went to a Target and Mike Epps was trying to parallel park and he, he hit the back of my car <laughs> right in front of me and I got mad and then I, I was like, and then I saw that it was Mike Epps and I was like, I was like, look, dude, you still hit my car. Like, you know, I'm a fan, but you hit my car because <laughs> uh, I am. I like Mike Epps. He's awesome. Um, and he was like, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, and, and, uh, and we just kind of, you know, settled on it and I was like, whatever. So it was a, a small scratch. Well, it was not a very small scratch, but um, a little dent too. Uh, but uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, so now we have Mila is waking up and her eye just opened. It's a shot that Paul Anderson goes back to often. And here comes just the blankest slate of a character ever. Um, 
and she wakes up and she's screaming because she's in pain, but she's ripping these tubes out of her head. It's a hard scene to watch uh, for sure as far as like I don't like needles being stuck in me when and I hate being in hospitals. Um, so it's a little tough scene for me to watch nowadays. I don't know if it was when I was younger and I saw this. This movie came out 2004, which would have made me 22, uh, I guess. Um, yeah, I would have been 22 years old. 2004. And this scene here where she's walking around outside Raccoon City and, and it's all destroyed, this is all footage from the first movie, so they're just kind of reusing it. Um, but yeah, the idea for Jill was that she was out on the town and she was like, she, she's she been let go from, she's you know, she's on sabbatical or something, like after the Raccoon uh, Arclay incident, they just don't want her around the police department because obviously she's trying to like expose Umbrella. So then she just went out one night to get drunk. She comes home at like eight in the morning in her skirt and uh and sees that things are going to hell which i'm like well why wouldn't she notice that while out drinking but whatever who cares um at least they gave her kind of a reason to be in the skirt i guess although i don't know why she didn't just spend two minutes to change but still they wanted her to look like the video game character which is fine i'm, I'm fine with that um it, it's that kind of fan service where you're like all right you want her recognizable as jill but you still could have done that with her in her stars uniform uh, this guy, Peyton, um, he's a made-up character. He's, uh, but I think he was originally going to be Barry because his outfit even looks like Barry's outfit as far as... A lot of the Stars members in the original game had these vests with no sh with no sleeves, and that's kind of what he's wearing. Uh, so this shot I hate. The woman go up the stairs, that's fine. Um, but when you see the zombies, they do this slow-mo thing. It's awful. It, I, that effect is so terrible. Um, so that scene, so anytime you see the zombies, not every time, like right now you're, they're not doing the slow-mo thing. And that's because the, the woman being attacked is in frame. Um, but, uh, but yeah, whenever they do the slow-mo thing, I hate it. I hate it so much. It's such a cheap looking effect. It, it feels like they did it in editing to cover maybe how bad the makeup looked, or I don't know what, what they why they did it but it was, maybe it was a creative choice but i thought it was stupid i think it looks terrible this looks fine when the zombies are just shuffling towards her and that overhead shot where she's running and the zombies are coming up it's like two seconds but it's a great shot i'm like why isn't that longer like here you get another two seconds of it it's like that's a great shot i would have stayed on that on that shot and just followed her across the rooftop um here you got the um the UBCS or whatever, the Umbrella Counter Squad Measure Unit or whatever the hell they're called, Countermeasure Squad. Um, you have Carlos Oliveira, uh, played by a guy who's not Hispanic, <laughs> but I do love Oded Fair. He's awesome. But uh, it's it's weird they would cast him for Carlos. Um, then you have Nikolai Genovev from the video games, who's kind of the bad guy in the video games. I think Zach Ward is the young man who plays him in this. Uh, Zach's been in a couple things. I, I like Zach. He's a, he's a good... He's he, he pops up every now and again and stuff. But he plays Nikolai G Genevieve. He he does an okay... Like, he does a, pass it, a passable Russian accent. But this scene here is kind of neat because it has Carlos... Carlos learning about how bad things are in Raccoon City. They just showed up. They're supposed to save people. And uh, and they find this woman, and she they're like, come with us. And she's like, no, I've been bitten. I see what happens when you get bit. You turn. And he's like, well, we can help you. And she's like, no, no, you can't. And she jumps off. I actually, that scene, if it didn't have all this terrible cutting and uh, these weird zoom shots and stuff, that would actually be a great scene. This is one of those movies that is definitely hurt massively by the editing, as is the sixth movie. And, uh, you know, I hope the editors who worked on these movies learned something about how awful they did of a job but then again who knows they could have been told to do this stuff so you can't really it's hard to blame uh or you know people negatively in movies because a lot of people are just doing their jobs and if they're like hey i did it one way the studio didn't like it or they screened it for an audience they want it done some other way um i can't imagine these movies were screened though if i was in a screening for these movies i would have ripped them to shreds um which i've done numerous times in movies um I, it's so much I've ripped things apart so much that they've actually been changed um, in movies when I was brought into focus groups and stuff. 
Um, because the one thing is I've always been good at is making good arguments for creative choices. Um, I like the business side of things and I like the creative side. I definitely dip more into the creative side, but I definitely speak the language of business people. And that wasn't always the case. I learned that through years of working in sales and stuff. So, uh, and through different companies from retail to movies to, you know, to comic books and stuff. And, and I learned a lot from people like my friend Omar um, and, uh, and Matt Hawkins at, at uh, Top Cow and Ryan at Golden Apple. And there's been a lot of people who run businesses or, or operate businesses that have taught me things about, about business and the perspective of it. And I'm grateful for that, you know, I, I, cause I learned a lot, even though I railed against some of the ideas at the time. Um, I'm glad that I'm, I used to be like 80% creative and 20% business. And now I'm probably like 55% creative and 45% business. So I'm actually pretty close to half and half. I feel, I mean, someone else might disagree. <laughs> if I work with them, they might disagree, but, um, so now you have this, this wall that was erected in one day in Raccoon City, less than a day, this giant wall that there's no way they could have done this. <laughs> the wall would have had to already have been there and been underground. And then they could have like been like activate the wall. And then the wall comes up to like, that would have made a lot of sense. I don't know if that was the concept originally that they wanted to do, but it's definitely not shown in the movie. The wall just appears there and it show they should actually show a schematic of them uh, planting the wall and building it and supporting it with, you know, beams and stuff. And you're just like, what? Like, like, I know they're all powerful and stuff, but it would just make more sense if they just always had, because, because the whole thing is in the in sixth movie, you realize that the umbrella corporation purposely leaked the virus and all the people who have high stakes in stock in the umbrella corporation who bought stock into them, like there's like, uh, you know, uh, like tens of thousands of people underground under Raccoon City right now, under the hive, who are cryogenically frozen. Um, and yet all of these people that work for Umbrella are apparently expendable <laughs> and they don't know anything about the big plan. And also you've, in the first movie, the the virus didn't, like they couldn't have controlled the leak unless they hired Spence to steal the, you know, like, like let's say Umbrella pretended to be another company and they said, hey, Spence, go in, steal the virus, bring it to us. And on your way out, drop a vial of it. Like maybe they planned that and that could have, that actually would have been kind of clever. But the movie doesn't say that. Because that would have been, if they said that in the sixth movie, like, oh, we, who do you think hired Spence to, you know, you know, to leak the virus? And then Alice could be like, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah, he thought we were working for, he, he thought I worked for somebody else. You know, he could be Wesker and he could be like, he thought I worked for someone else, but he didn't know I worked for Umbrella. Yeah, it's simple simple like that easy but no they don't do that um so we have ashford here talking to uh just the worst named character uh this is i think his name is i think his real name is thomas kretschman uh and i'm, I'm sorry if i'm butchering his name because it's like kretschman um i think he was in he was in avengers age of ultron i think i think he played um Oh, God, I can't remember his name. The guy with the monocle. Um, he's a pretty good actor. I mean, they have a good cast in this movie. Um, they, they did a pretty good job. Jared Harris there, who plays uh, um, Ashford, he's going to be in Morbius coming up. Um, so that uh, And he's a good actor. I like him. Um, but uh, Thomas Kretschmann, <laughs> how do you ever say his last name? He actually plays a character named Major Tom. <laughs> oh, God, I hate this movie. Um yeah, his name's Major Tom. Major Tom something. Like, he's got a... I can't remember his last name. It's a... Uh, hold on, I have it here. Um, Major Tom Kane. Like, Kane and Abel. I mean, like, just the metaphors that uh, Paul Anderson has to mix. I remember in, like, the first movie, he was like, oh, the reason the character's name is Alice is because it's I wanted to write, like, an Alice in Wonderland, and she goes further down the rabbit hole, and that's why she goes into a hole in the ground t to the hive, and you're like... This is so dumb, dude. And I think the original script for the first movie had Tweedledum and Tweedledee references. And um, Spence looking at his watch was like a reference to the, the White Rabbit or whatever. Uh, the Red Queen says off with their heads. That's how you kill zombies. So Paul Anderson, like, he had all these ideas to make the first movie like an Alice in Wonderland allegory. Which I'm like, make a Resident Evil movie, dumbass. Like, <laughs> why are you making a, an Alice in Wonderland <laughs> references? Uh, he just loves mixing. And he's like, oh, but I have scenes in here from like Omega Man. I have scenes in here from this and that. And I'm just like, yeah, I know you rip a lot of your stuff off. You don't do anything original. Like, but you don't do anything. You don't focus on story. Like, like you don't focus on 
the, the like the process of storytelling you just like all right well here's here are the sets i need here like he's just all technical and he has i would say paul anderson has like maybe maybe 15 percent creativity in him um and then everything else is just ideas he takes from other things because uh, even the room in the first movie that like the the glass room the through the looking glass room whatever has lasers in it and and that cuts you into cubes like the movie cube did when that wire comes down only cl- cube is far more clever um than that uh than this you know these movies so this is um alice getting clothed <laughs> she like breaks into a um an army surplus store i think and grabs some clothes that's fine because i think there was a scene in resident evil 3 where jill goes into a, a place and and get some changes wardrobe or something so it's like a nod to that again he, he makes the weirdest nods to the games i remember in the first movie he's like i gotta have scenes of doors opening because the game has a tons of ton of doors opening and i'm like that's the thing you focus on like it's he's so god he's so bad i feel like i'm sorry man um, he must do some things, right? Because he keeps getting these movies. Well, he certainly makes money on these movies. I think I think this is a billion-dollar franchise now. If you add up how much all six of these movies have profited, I think it's an, a, a billion dollars, over a billion dollars. So, I mean, hey, he did something right. And he married Milijovic, so he's he's clearly he's clearly there's something I'm missing. <laughs> like the guy has some some kind of charm and charisma. Because uh, uh, I don't I don't get it. He's not bad to listen to. Like when I hear him talk, I'm like, I don't hate the guy for sure. I just don't don't like the execution of his movies. And granted, he only wrote this movie; he didn't direct it, but he also produced it. Um, this scene here, where he showed all the gargoyles, there is an original cut where the camera folds down or, or pans around, and as they go into the church, you see one of the gargoyles move, and you find out it's not a gargoyle at all; it's a liquor. I don't know why that's cut for this version. I've seen a longer cut of this movie. I can't remember how. But I, I saw a longer cut of this movie, um, and it's it's just as terrible. Um, so Sienna Galori, who plays Jill, that was the worst reaction ever. The guy comes up, sneaks around, and aims a gun at her, and she just casually turns. She's actually uh, like a second slower than the other two. And she just gently glides her gun around to aim it at the guy. And I'm like, eh. Jill's way faster than that, and yeah. This scene here where she's lighting her cigarette um, is just uh, terrible. <laughs> I love Sienna Glory as far as her look. She looks great as Jill. From what I heard, the studio or something, like the, I guess they had a problem working with her. That's a rumor. I don't know if that's true or not. I hope that's not true. She seems like a lovely person, actually. She looks great. She looks a lot like Jill. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. They didn't bring her back for any of the movies until the fifth movie, and even then, they reduced her role because they brought Millie, uh, not Millie, um, uh, Michelle Rodriguez and Oded Fair back uh, for no for no reason at all. Other than they just wanted to work with them again, um, which is fine. It's great. You know, it's like you make friends on these movies, and you're like, oh, we killed Michelle in the first one, and now she's in the Fast and Furious movie. She's a star. She draws an audience. We should bring her back in this movie, and we'll make her evil. We'll make her a clone. And it's but you're kind of like, but why would Umbrella? make a clone of her like she was just a mercenary like in the first game or the first movie they were just all mercenaries so why would there be clones of one and rain and compo and stuff like that this scene i've seen a longer version of this scene too um the longer scene's a little bit better uh you basically find out that the priest or pastor or whatever in this church has kept uh, his wife alive um even though she's a zombie and he won't kill her he just tied her to a chair somehow he got her tied down before she turned um so it's kind of neat like little scenes like this where it, it has like random characters with a little bit of background like this oh and he feeds her he's feeding her like altar boys or something um this this kind of reminds me a little bit of a uh, resident evil 2 of um chief irons someone who's just broken after this but this this all happened in one day so it's like so him you know being like oh i I'm keeping my wife alive and feeding her. It's like, dude, the zombie outbreak just happened earlier this day. How does, how did everyone lose it this much so fast? You know, it's like, they act like it's been months of zombies. Um, so nothing's earned in this. It's all just, we need that. We need this kind of scene. Or I've seen this in a movie. We got to put this kind of scene in it, and that's kind of how it is. Um, but Sienna Galori, like I said, she looks great as Jill. Um, I've heard rumors that she, she wasn't 
easy to work with or so someone said that or someone didn't like her or the studio didn't like her or something i don't know what it was but uh but i'm glad they brought her back for the fifth movie and they did the resident Evil 5 version of jill where she's uh has the scarab on her chest i'm like yeah that's kind of cool so we'll talk that's one of the few compliments i'll give the fifth movie we'll talk about that when we get there um also the mo- the fact that the movies aren't named resident Evil one or resident Evil two three four and five and they give them subtitles i hate that um Fast and the Furious does that too. It's just like, just call it Fast and the Furious 4 or Fast and the Furious 5. Like, they kind of do. They go Fast 7, you know, Fast 8 or whatever. <laughs> um, I think Red Letter Media made a joke that the next one will just be called The Nine. And they're just going to start, they're going to remove more words. <laughs> they can't call it Nine because there was already an animated movie called Nine, but they'll call it The Nine. Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I like Red Letter Media. I'm a big fan of theirs. They actually have a great Resident Evil uh, video where they watch. Uh, like one through four all in one day which just sounds like torture <laughs> and i'm a resident evil fan but i can't i can't stand these movies they they, they bum me out uh this shot here where the guy's looking around and the liquor jump like the, the terrible jump scare of it like the geography doesn't even make sense the tongue comes around him from the angle he was already looking at and then he turns back and faces the way he started at so he makes a full circle and then the tongue is he has the the creature still has to jump towards him with it's like uh and that's paul anderson he's like oh the the liquors are popular so let's put them in the movie and the dogs are popular let's put them in the movie and obviously we gotta have zombies um and nemesis is popular so put but so but he just does these things it's like when they made the silent hill movie and they put uh pyramid head in it now granted that's a a little bit different pyramid head is if you don't know about silent hill is very specific to james sunderland who is the character the main character you play as in silent hill 2 that monster pyramid head is specific to him uh, it should not exist at in anyone else's eyes like they should not be able to see pyramid head silent hill brings your worst nightmares to life pyramid head is james's uh, worst nightmare in a way it, it's 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 um part of him that likes to punish himself for the wrong he's done or wants to punish himself for the wrong he's done that he's not aware of until the end of the game so uh so yeah so uh so this this isn't as bad but it's still it's like I got let's just throw in let's throw in monsters let's throw in nemesis it's like okay but nemesis hunts stars members so in this movie it's he starts off hunting stars going after jill and peyton and other stars members that are just put in there so they can get killed real quick and then it's like okay there's only two stars members left or one stars member left but there's alice so then now it's reprogrammed to go after alice and you're just like then why even have the stars in it like and paul anderson wanted to do this thing where he said i want to make the first movie a prequel to the first game because in the game they never explained where these outbreak came from which is true but by the time he started making these movies zero was in production and resident evil zero does explain where the outbreak started and how it started so you would think in that moment he would have been like okay we got to change course uh then he was like i want my second movie to take place during the games like during one of the games so he picked resident evil 3 because it's set in raccoon city obviously um and that's set up in the first movie and then he's like and now i want to make a third movie that takes place years after the games and it's like okay but the games are still going (laughs) like it's like he almost like he thought the franchise would end of games and uh and it's just weird and when you hear him talk on the commentary tracks for these movies he says like oh yeah when when the first commentary track he's like oh yeah uh res evil zero is coming out soon and so is res evil one remake and you know res evil four is in talks or so he he's fully aware he works with capcom on these sometimes so uh so shame on capcom for being okay with all this bs but then again you don't know when making movies you don't know oh this is my i hate this scene miller just crashed through the glass at the church and she's driving in to save the others from the liquors so the liquors are all like you know attacking the the team and then here she comes with her superpowers and her motorcycle and she just ordering people around and being like uh, you know and then she flips off her motorcycle so in the clothes she's wearing it's it's um i think it's called ravenhawk or something like that i can't remember Mila designed her clothes. She started her own clothing line because she obviously she's a supermodel also. She designed her own clothing line. Uh, after the success of the first Resident Evil movie, she was an even bigger name than she was before because she made some great uh, indie films and dramatic roles. And then she obviously she did Fifth Element, which really put her on the map. But this kind of really elevated her career. Um, and, you know, to give these fran- this franchise credit, this is, I think, one of the most profitable female action movie franchises out there. Underworld, I don't know how 
profitable those were, but I know those were they made like four or five of those movies. So um, and those came out around the same time as Resident Evil. But Resident Evil, it is. It's like uh, it's like Alien. You know, it's like the Alien franchise where they have Ripley as the main character, um, or Sarah Connor in the Terminator franchise. But like both of those franchises, they made they just made one too many movies. <laughs> There's just too many Resident Evil movies because they they're all bad. Um, yeah, even that delivery, I hate like. Who the fuck are you? Jill said, and you're just like, ah, oh, man. I, I know I've seen Sienna and a couple other movies. I think some romance movies and stuff. Um, and she's, she's good, but I, 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 as Jill, she just has the look of Jill down, but I don't know, like some of her lines, I feel like, I feel like there's probably, I don't know if there's better takes or, you know, but, um, I think the person with the most personality in this is probably Mike Epps, even though he's goofy. Um, I think he's got the most personality in this movie. Everyone else is so dour and, and, you know, and I get it. It's zombies. It's the end of the world. It's, you know, all that stuff. And, and the games are like that too, where there's a lot of dourness, but um, I feel like when you're making a zombie movie, there's, there's room for a little bit of tongue in cheek or a little bit of self-awareness. I feel, um, Um, so we have here Carlos and his team fighting zombies in the middle of the street next to RPD cars, uh, which is neat. Uh, this is like a scene that's taken from the games, although they're just putting the UBCS team in its place instead of the, the cops. The cops look like they've already been killed. They're all laying dead around everywhere. Um, and Carlos, he just got saved there by Nikolai, which would have never happened in the games because Nikolai's a bad guy. But they just didn't have more, they didn't have room for more bad guys in this movie, apparently. Um, so they didn't actually make any of these guys characters. So here you see the police getting killed and stars members. Cause you can see the guys in the vests without the sleeves, which also is what Carlos and them wear, but they have like dark clothes underneath and the stars members have like lighter colors, like white and gray, um, or like a bright gray, um, and like a, like a light blue, um, but yeah, but Carlos and those guys, they're, they're all, you know darker colors darker tones so here you find out that uh, ashford is hacked into the computers or the 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 um cameras around the city and uh and he's using umbrellas tech to look for someone who can help him find his daughter these shots here where they're kind of rolling in on the helmet and then you see the reflection of the zombie walking up that's actually a great shot that's from the game too um it's done a little stupid uh, here in the movie. Like the, the angle doesn't make sense, but whatever. It's a nitpick. Uh, then walking through a graveyard. This is kind of neat because uh, there is a graveyard in Resident Evil 3, the game, and zombies do come out of the ground. So this is definitely a reference to that scene. Um, but that's only if you've played the original Resident Evil 3. If you played the newer, shittier remake of it, uh, there is no cemetery scene in it. <laughs> and I will have my Resident Evil video game reviews. I reviewed um, <clears throat> Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, all three remakes. And I have those going up in October on my gaming channel. Um, so if it's past October of 2020, those are available, and you can go check them out if you want. But I do not like the Resident Evil 3 remake at all. Um, there's a few... The graphics are great and everything, but um, visually it's it's fine. But I think it's... I feel like it's made by Paul W. S. Anderson feel like it's a mess and and the, i feel like the characters are awful and uh i think carlos is the only character in that game i actually like and terrell too a little bit they actually expanded terrell's character but i'll get into that in that review but then here you have alice who's like if you get bit you die i'm gonna kill you i'm just gonna shoot you that's how it is you know no compassion no anything um and then peyton realizes he's been bit so so he's now concerned that at any second he's going to get shot in the face by um, by Alice. <laughs> but Jill says, you know, if, if he turns, I'll kill him myself. And then even though they have guns, um, Mila just does kung fu to these zombies. So do all of them. They all, like Jill, she, boom, snaps one's neck, grabs him by the throat, which I think is a risky move because it could just lean down and bite her. Uh, more slow-mo cam where Alice jumps across a tombstone and does a super kick. I'm guessing that's to cover how bad the stunt looked, I'm going to assume. Um, 
Because I feel like if stunts look good when you do them in a movie, you should show them. Um, but uh, I think a lot of times editors don't feel that way. Uh, and sometimes the stunts don't look good and you got to cover them with something. So I'm going to assume that shot looked like shit until they, they put the slow-mo on it. But honestly, I'd rather look at a bad stunt kind of or just cut that two seconds from the movie um, because because uh, that slow-mo stuff looks awful. And then they end on that shot with the, the zombie with the rest in peace. And you're like, Ugh, okay, there, I guess that's your attempt at kind of wink, wink humor. But it, that's not a good example of it. Not a good job. Um, so, all right. So now they're hacking into the Nemesis. So in the video games, Nemesis was never from Raccoon City. This is something the movie added where they took Matt Addison's body from the first game and they turned him into Nemesis in this lab that's um, underneath the hospital. Uh, turns out uh, the Resident Evil 3 remake rips that right from this movie, uh, which is another reason for me to hate this movie. Uh, they're underneath the hospital in Resident Evil 3 remake, there is a lab where Nemesis was created. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hate that. <laughs> I hate that so much. I hate that they put that in the remake universe. It's lazy. It's just lazy storytelling. Because in the original, they inferred at least that Nemesis was created from a parasite that was at the Umbrella uh, Europe facility. And then they put that parasite into a body and did testing on it. And, and, uh, and so... It seemed like Europe had their pro project, and then Raccoon City had their project with Birkin and the G-Virus, and then um, Rockford Island had their project uh, with the Antarctic base with Alexia Ashford and the Code Veronica virus. So it seemed like everyone kind of had their thing, and they were all competing against each other to develop the next great thing for Umbrella that would make them a ton of money. And uh, and so, <laughs> like Nemesis was, was going to be a military thing, G-Virus could have also been a military application, but also expanded on some pharmaceutical drugs that could help people. Um, and then Alexia Ashford was basically trying to find a way to live forever through the code Veronica virus by stabilizing her body with the virus in it, um, which was something Spencer, uh, you know, Oswald E. Spencer wants is immortality. So I feel like everyone was working on their own thing and there was like a cohesiveness to the Resident Evil games up until they got to about the fourth and fifth game. And then it just kind of all went to shit uh, because I felt like the game started being influenced by the movies to an extent. And even to the point where in Resident Evil 4, I think there's a laser hallway and you're just like, oh my God. Like, So yeah, I I'm not a fan of the impact that these movies have had on the games. But I do know that um, like a lot of things, you know, when I don't like something, like, uh, like if I'm a fan of a franchise, but they make a version I don't like, um, f f there are people that come into the Resident Evil universe because of the movies. So, like, uh, the there are people who are Resident Evil fans of the games because they saw the movies first and liked the movies. So, so they they serve a purpose. Like, even if I don't like them, they they definitely brought in more Resident Evil fans, and they made Resident Evil kind of a household name um, to an extent because these movies were very successful, especially overseas. All right, so Carlos is now bit. His friend Yuri turned on him. They should have shot him when they had the chance. Everyone turns at a different rate. I think that's pretty similar to the game. So I saw someone once years ago nitpick that in their review of this, but I'm like, well, that's kind of makes sense. Everybody has a different, you know, biology. So uh, here are the stars members. You got the sniper on the roof, uh, which in the game is Forrest Spayer, and Forrest, as far as I know, is not a redneck or a cowboy. Uh, <laughs> But uh, whatever, they're just they they have to bring in the stars here um, to show that uh, you know and have Nemesis kill them. But it's weird because none of them mention Jill. Like they're they're not like uh, you know no one's asking about Jill. Like hey, Jill was right. Like you know uh, she took a stars member, a couple stars members with her to that mansion, and they never came back. And we didn't believe Jill, and we exiled her. You could have had some real drama there, and uh, you know with some of the characters and actually do character things and and have a plot and story. But uh, they don't. I love that. Motherfucker, please. <laughs> With the gold guns. I actually like that. I think that's funny. <laughs> I also like when he hits the guy. He goes, GTA, motherfucker. <laughs> um, that happened earlier, I think. I, I don't know. It's it's, schlo it's schlocky and stupid, but it's like, eh. I like Mike Epps. He, he's, a, he's a charismatic dude. Um, so here's where Nemesis shows up. Uh, they admit that they had to shoot him a certain way. And they had to fix some of the shots and editing 
because they said he looked very dumpy uh, when you showed him in widescreen, um, you know, in that format. He looked very dumpy. He didn't look as tall as he he was because I guess on the set he was like tall. He's like s over seven feet tall. It was like a guy in a uniform, a suit, obviously. Um, but they said when they shot him, he just looked kind of dumpy. So they ex they stretched the the footage, which you can tell because the quality does look a little less in some of those shots. Like you can tell, like that footage was stretched to make him look taller. Um, but it's one of those things where you're like, you shot that on the day and you didn't realize how bad he looked, or maybe they did and they were just like, make a note. When we get into the editing room, we got to stretch the footage. Um, but, uh, or maybe the editor came up with that as a solution. So yeah, I mean, everyone works as a team and I don't mean to just crap on the editor of this movie, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that slow-mo zombie crap is a note that they got that they had to put in there um, and that the editor did the best they could <laughs> with, with the terrible footage they had. I can't, I can't imagine, like, if someone handed me all the footage of this movie and said, make a coherent movie out of this, I'd be like, fuck you, I quit. <laughs> um, yep. So, Nemesis just kills, yeah, it says kill stars members. So, he, now he's programmed to kill them. He's got 5,000 bullets in his gun. He's so precise with his rail gun or his uh, submachine gun that he has, this giant machine gun. Uh, it's actually like a helicopter-sized machine gun. Um, he's so precise with it that he shot around Mike Epps and killed everybody in the room, all the stars members. Um, and honestly, they would be all putty. Like they're, they're laying there with holes in their asses and chests, but they would be putty. Like uh, all those bullets going through you would shred a human being. Uh, this shot here is neat, um, where he drops the guns and the nemesis is like, oh, he's not a threat anymore. So then Nemesis just lets him live. I mean, his his programming at the time is is kill star, so it makes sense that he would not waste the ammo or bullets or whatever. But it's it's still interesting. It's it's an interesting moment because you feel like oh, there's it's a slave to its programming. Is it has to do this? Um, so that I guess that's good because at the end they set up that. Matt Addison, who's in there, is trying to break through the programming once he sees Alice. Um, and I didn't mind that too much, like adding humanity to Nemesis and adding someone in there that the main character knew. That's fine. I mean, it's it's something. It's character, you know? So it's like, okay, that's fine. I don't mind it. But uh, they just don't... The, the whole thing where at the end it's like, you guys are going to get in a fist fight to prove who's the best. I'm like, that's such a... All this has been building to this, just that. Like, this guy just wants to know who's tougher between Alice, superhuman Alice and Nemesis. It seems so dumb. Um, so here the phone ringing, uh, this building that they're going to come back to later. It's funny cause it's like, uh, they use it for this shot and then they come back to it. I think later, <laughs> like, um, I think they do that a couple times in this movie where they're like, all right, we got to use this location twice. So we got to shoot it two different ways. Um, there's a lot of night shoots on this movie. As you can tell, mostly it's at nighttime. They don't do, I hate when movies shoot in the daytime and then the, in post they make it look like nighttime cause you can totally tell it's not nighttime. So I like that this is all shot at night, but that makes for really tough film shoots a lot of times because uh, it's always cold at night, especially in Vancouver. Um, and look how they're dressed. Like, they're not dressed for cold weather, especially Jill <laughs> and Alice. Um, I like that they're doing the scene on the bus. Like, you know, bus is a recurring image in the video games. And plus, when you're doing a scene where it's like, oh, these characters have to just have dialogue, um, you want it to be something semi-interesting. So I like that they lo like are hiding in a bus um, because that makes sense. Them walking out in the open is like dumb because that's where the previous scene was. But they needed to walk out in the open because of the phone. They needed the phone to ring. So it's like, again, sometimes things just happen in these movies because like Paul Anderson, I could just see him writing these scripts and going like, um, you know, like, yeah, that's perfect. That makes so much sense. They're walking down the street and the phone just rings and you know, and then, and, uh, okay, now they're going to go and have a conversation in a bus because it makes no sense for them to walk around outside. It's like, but you just had them walking around outside. Um, I know they got to get to places and they got to get out of the city, but I don't know, whatever. Uh, these, these movies are, they just, I don't know. They lose my interest. I, I and of course I can always play devil's advocate, even with myself, even when I critique something negatively, I can always try to come up with an argument to counter it, but these movies don't do a good job of explaining those arguments. I have to, I win no prizes for basically defending the movie 
in a way that does make sense to me, but that the movie doesn't use to defend itself, um, or Paul Anderson doesn't in interviews. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not a. It's just bad storytelling. Okay, so now we have Alice on the bridge. She has a spider sense apparently, and she can sense that Nemesis is here. She's like, "There's something down there," and they're like, "Where? Well, we don't see anything." And she goes, "Well, that doesn't alter the fact that there's something down there." She just said that line, by the way. Yeah, I know that line by heart because I hate that line. <laughs> that doesn't alter the fact that there is something down there. Uh, so Peyton, boom, just now shot dead. Um, and that just leaves Jill. Jill's all by all by herself. She's the last Stars member. Um, and Umbrella doesn't mention her. They have no reaction to her. They're not like, oh, this is the lady that um, went to the mansion. They don't show flashbacks of Jill Go, like there's no character to Jill. Like you know that would have been something to do is like start off and have um you know Jill in the mansion and her team gets taken down um or something you know like she's or she's or I don't know like they could have done something like that. I know Umbrella went to the mansion and opened it up, but that's what they could have done. It could have been like you know a couple weeks out, like a week or two after that, and they go to the mansion and then their team gets killed, and then Jill goes back. That could have been the opening, but instead you had you know, Alice, like, narrate for seven minutes or whatever um, on a previously on Resident Evil, and you're just like, you don't need this. Your movies aren't that smart uh, to, to where people are going to forget the dumbness of them. <laughs> like, um, So, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I think he does those opening narrations. I mean, I think it's just a time killer, really. I mean, Paul Anderson keeps putting them in his Resident Evil movies. I think they're just a way to fill space because he has to hit his 90 pages. And that's what it feels like. It just feels like a bunch of garbage to get to that 90-page check mark. Like, all of these feel like first drafts. And I'm sure Paul, I know for a fact that they're not first drafts, but they, they come across as, like, first drafts when you look at, like, pacing and story. And and this feels like an assembly cut. Like, these movies don't even feel like final cuts of movies. They feel like, uh, you know, assembly cuts almost, just with finished effects um, and finished sound. So Millis or Alice is like shooting a hole in the wall so she can slide through the, um, uh, I don't know, like a clothes shoot, laundry shoot. She breaks her finger on the way down, which is supposed to be this like traumatizing moment for her. But then she just resets her finger right after she survives a rocket exploding right next to her. <laughs> yeah. stars he doesn't say it anymore he said it once when he shot up the, the stars around mike epps but he doesn't say it anymore because now he's been reprogrammed to hunt alice so i just want to know in what world where paul anderson was like i'm going to make movies that are set in the video game universe and how he could fail so terribly at it like because this is there's no way these events happened alongside the video game Usually when you make a movie, you think of it as an alternate reality. You go, okay, this is not going to be the the movie or the games. Like, it can't be. Uh, the games are already its own continuity, already its own story. And to do a direct translation would be very lazy. Uh, you would be ba basically getting paid millions of dollars to just r copy someone's homework. And, uh, and, and nobody really wants that. Although, if you've seen the latest Transformers Netflix cartoon, I feel like everyone who worked on that show, that's exactly what they did. Um but but that's a side rant for another for a transformer episode another day, because um, I don't I still don't think I posted um, my review for the final three episodes as of recording this, but uh, but I will. I don't like that show. I feel like it's just a bunch of people copying homework. So you don't want to do that, obviously. Oh, there's Peyton, and Jill has to now shoot him. I don't know how he came back. I mean, I guess because he wasn't shot in the head by Nemesis, but he was shot a lot by Nemesis. And so you could have had real character stuff there um, where, like, you flash back and you show Jill. Maybe there was a Stars member like uh, Barry or someone in the mansion with her. Uh, and then she had to shoot him to kill, you know, and then now and she couldn't do it. And maybe now she's like, I got to do it. And she kills Peyton and then she cries like you could have had a real moment there if you added any backstory to Jill. But instead, it, all of her backstory is in a newspaper that was promotional for the movie, which not everyone got. And you're just like, 
whatever. It's, it's so bad. Um, I remember Mila saying when she originally got cast uh, in these movies, she thought she was going to play Jill Valentine. And then she read the script and was like, well, who the hell's Alice? Because she knew the games at least a little bit because her little brother played them. And Paul Anderson apparently was a huge fan of the games, but you couldn't tell that watching these movies because, well, you can a little bit. You can tell that there's fan service in here, but it's like that's all there is. There's you, you can tell a filmmaker did not make these movies. And I know some people are going to be like, well, dude, I think you have a too high of a standard. Like, you know, it's just Resident Evil. It doesn't. It's like, yeah, I know it is just Resident Evil, but you can do a better job at translating it to a movie. Like I said, it's not the video game universe. You don't want it to be a direct copy. You can embellish. You can add new characters. You can add an Alice. I don't care about any of that stuff. Uh, what I care about is that you just tell a good story the best that you can. And I don't feel like this is anyone's best. In fact, I think half these movies had stunt people die on them in stunts that shouldn't even be in Resident Evil movies. Like, they, like there shouldn't be cars flipping over each other and stuff. Like, I know there was some of that in Resident Evil 5 when there was, like, zombies on motorcycles, like, ramping off of things, and they did these big actions. But nobody likes Resident Evil 5 <laughs> for that reason. Like, that's one of the things everybody hates about Resident Evil 5 is that it's, it's mostly action. Like, and Resident Evil 5 wasn't even out when this, uh, this, these movies came out. So it's it's very frustrating the, the impact these movies had on those games, uh, because Resident Evil was horror first. It's like sci-fi horror. <laughs> so Jill is now giving orders, uh, telling the weather lady, ha handing her a gun, and being like, "All right, go." go to this floor and check like they're they're in the school looking for a little girl they got separated from alice so but they're trying to still carry out the mission um and they picked up lj along the way which is played by mike epps so this shot here where it's like jill walking down the hallway and she's in silhouette and she's got the flashlight that's actually a beautiful shot and of course you only get like five four sec four or five seconds of it and that's it um because every time there's a beautiful shot in this like this shot's good where they're panning across the the science lab in the school and you see Mike Epps come in the room and then they're panning through the the the, uh, the bottles of different things it's neat it, they're good shots like I think Alexander Witt has a good eye when it comes to framing things but then w whenever it gets into the action stuff it's it's a mess and it's weird because he is a second unit director from a lot of action movies and yet the action in this movie is is awful um, there's going to be a scene later where Mila like, like um, runs down the side of a building with a, you know, with like a, um, a bungee around her, in the, for the stunt. But it's so unnecessary. You're like, why did they have to go up to the roof of a building just to come back down to surprise like two guards? It, it's it's so overly compli. It's like, it's like they came up with the stunt and they were like, well, who cares if it makes sense. And that's just how these movies are. Like, oh, I have an idea for a stunt. And it's like, yeah, but it's a stunt that's going to risk someone's life. Like, granted, nothing happened to Mila on that stunt, but it could have. And why do you have that in a Resident Evil movie? Why are cars flipping over each other? Why is she running down the side of a building? Why are people, you know, jumping out of helicopters and all this stuff? It's like, it, it or ramming, you know, SUVs into flying bat creature monsters. Like, it's so, so dumb. This is also where the logic of the movie doesn't, it doesn't have any internal logic. Like zombies are slow moving, shuffling, and you can hear them coming a mile away. Um, but in this, like she goes up to a little girl here. It's not the little girl she's looking for. It's a zombie girl. And she turns around all of a sudden there's 50 kids, zombie kids in the room with her. And you're just like, what? Now I think that's creepy that they actually made zombie kids. Because that adds to the horror of, you know, oh, Umbrella, they're vile. Look at this. They, they're actual kids that are infected and turned into zombies. Um, and then you have Jill here. She's in a basketball court looking around, taking her sweet time. She somehow hears the scream from the other side of the school from uh, the weather lady. And she goes to investigate and she sees blood everywhere like the lady was dragged away. And all 50 of those kids are gone now. And you're just like, what? Like zombies don't move like like there's no in there's no internal logic to the story <clears throat> things just happen because they need to happen there's no it doesn't matter if it makes sense to the and again 
are zombies real? No. Do zombies make sense? No, not really. But when you, but that's the thing you buy into when you go to these movies and you see a horror movie, you have to buy into certain things. Great. But there are rules to these creatures and rules to these things. And this movie and all these movies just paid no attention to those rules because they don't give a crap. So this little girl, Angie, now she's met up with Jill. Um, I like this. I like that Jill's kind of like, you know, her guardian in this, but then that can't happen because everything's got to be Alice. So pretty soon Alice shows up with Jill's cigarettes and looks cool. And Angie immediately likes Alice. And then when they find out they both have T-virus in them, they bond. <clears throat> and you're like, okay. And then Angie and Jill have no bond really for the rest of the, the movie. <laughs> um, and now we got the zombie dogs coming in. They're in the cafeteria. Uh, and Carlos's team has shown up. He's already saved Mike Epps, but now we're going to get um, Nikolai is going to show up to save Jill. But then he's going to just get killed right away anyway. Um, and yeah, so he's just coming in, one shotting everything. He's a badass. I like when he says, <laughs> he shoots the dog and goes, stay. I like that. Oh, forgot about one dog, didn't you? <laughs> so he's in there flirting with Jill, and then the dog bites him. <clears throat> but instead of saving him, like, she could have just went and picked up her gun and killed the dog. But instead of doing that, she just leaves him behind. He's like, go get the girl. And it's like, okay. So anyway, he's dead now. Um, and then Jill follows the little girl into the, the kitchen. And they're going to get into some shenanigans in here. And it's it's terrible. But yeah, you have to have some kind of like logic to your monsters. You have to have some kind of reason and purpose to them. They have to be consistent. That's the main thing is they have to be consistent. So um, having one scene with 50 kids show up, it's like, I mean, yeah, you can't have them kill the kids, obviously. Because having zombie kids is already a step uh, <laughs> really into the R rating. But, uh, but then if they sat around shooting all the kids, that would have been way, way more intense. And it would probably would have been an NC-17 rating um, for that. Uh, but uh, So I understand that, but it's like, I don't know. I understand you want to sell the horror that, okay, this is bad and there's even zombie kids now. But, uh, but then you, they don't really do anything with it other than just having one weather lady die. Which she could have died a number of other ways, so... And that's the other thing. Surprisingly, they hold back a lot. You don't see a lot of the... Like, the deaths are really quick shots, and, and they don't linger on them. And that's like that's the thing about horror. Like, the video games do that really well, where it's like these long bites when they bite into your show, especially the remakes. Holy cow. But uh, but the old games, they would do that. Like, they you'd get bit, and you have to, like, shake the zombie off, and it was like a battle, and there would be blood running down your shoulder, um, and you'd have to, like, elbow them and punch them off or kick them off and then shoot them. It was way more visceral in these movies like they just it's like someone gets bitten and they they you hear the crunch sound like the sound of celery being bit you know eaten and then boom that's it um it's like they they, they just cut away it's like you hear the bite and that's it sometimes you see blood or sometimes you see like the remnants of an organ hit the ground but that's it um so here we go a mary sue again uh jill failed at she like leaked the gas or turned on the ovens and then uh which it would take a lot longer for the the gas to fill that room um but whatever it doesn't matter so she turned on the ovens and she throws her lighter and the lighter or the something it doesn't work like or she throws like her matches and it doesn't work but then alice she flicks a cigarette and it works so it's just one of those things where i'm like well jill had cigarettes she could have done that scene but it's like every time something major needs to happen another character can't do it it has to be alice every time uh, and that's what i mean about the script is like it's like paul anderson's writing he's like oh jill's a fan favorite we got to put her in here but every time they get to a point where jill actually did like she killed peyton sure but she doesn't take down nemesis later she doesn't you know blow up those dogs just then uh she didn't even save those like nikolai came in to save her from the original dogs so it's like everything gets handed to another character randomly or alice has to do it or and it's like it's it's more noticeable in the third movie uh or fourth movie where 
Claire is like trying to kill something and she can't and Alice has to do it. And then there was a time where like a little girl in the fourth movie, because all these movies, the second movie, the fourth movie and the sixth movie all have little girls in them. And every movie forgets the little girl from the previous movies <laughs> like this right here. We're getting the origin. You see the wheelchair there and the crutches here. We're finding out that Ashford had a daughter. She was sick. He was trying to cure her. And in doing so created the T virus. He was trying to use the T virus to like to cure her. And Umbrella was like, we're taking your, vi your, your work away from you. We're taking the T virus away from you. And he's like, but I need it. I'm close to perfecting it. I, I can maybe save my daughter. And, by giving her injections, small injections of the T virus every day, it's rejuvenating a certain part of her body that it will allow her to walk. So there's good that can come from this, and he's been using it to heal his daughter. Um, but then in the sixth movie, you're going to find out that there's another guy named James Marcus. So there's Marcus Ashford. Then in the sixth movie, there's a guy named James Marcus who also has a daughter um, who has progeria. And he's trying to stop her from aging too quickly. And so he uses T-Virus on her. And that's who ends up being Mila Jovovich's character. And you're like, you just like shoot me in the head, man. Like, ugh, these movies. So they just ignore this movie. So that's what I'm saying. Like, little girl in this movie and her dad and the backstory they give them matters not because they retcon it in the sixth movie. Because there can't be two creators of the T-Virus who both have daughters. Like, it's like he stole his own idea and then changed it. Like, he doesn't all... It's it's so weird. He's like... It's like Paul Anderson. He watches Omega Man. He watches, like, uh, you know, uh, Escape from New York. He watches the Romero movies. And he just goes, okay, let's just do all that in this movie. And then when he made the fourth, fifth, and sixth Resident Evil movies, he's like, hey, let's go watch Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3 and just do everything they did in those movies and redo them in, in these new movies. <laughs> and you're like... Dude, you did those. Like you wrote all those scripts. Now you're just aping off yourself and you're doing a and you're aping badly like you always do. Like you're doing a bad parody of your own stuff now. It's uh yeah, it's pretty terrible. So anyway, so now Ashford has Alice on the phone and he tells her a helicopter's coming to City Hall. That's where, you know, the extraction's gonna be. Um, even though he has no guarantee that they'll let her on the helicopter. But I think he's just saying, like, you can kill everyone over there and you can use that helicopter to get out. But now Major Tom <laughs> is talking to ground control Marcus here and uh, and tells him, like, it, it's so disappointing that you, um, you've turned against us and, you, you know, like, you're trying to use Alice and helping her to escape. And then he comes in, he's like, you thought I didn't know you were betraying us. So it's like trying to make your villain sound like he's smart and that he knew about this all along, but he did nothing until now for no reason. Um, so the Angie has uh, a lunchbox that has the antivirus in it. That's what she gives herself as an injection every day. So because there's some antivirus in it, she's able to cure Carlos, who's been bit and infected. So I guess the antivirus will work on him. Oh, I'm sorry. Angie has the T-virus in her, but she has to take the antivirus every day to keep it in check. Um, which is a neat story. That's actually a neat idea. Like, as someone who has a proclivity to brain aneurysms and can develop new ones, like, I like that idea for this story where it's like a little girl who the T-virus is in her and, it's, and she has to constantly battle it. And every, like, 24 hours now... Her, it's getting so bad that we're just taking an injection every 24 hours. Maybe it used to be once a month. Now it's once a week. So it, it puts a ticking clock on the little girl's life even. Um, uh, they do actually, Angie, they do kill Angie in the novels. I have the novels to, um, they never made a novelization of the fourth movie, Afterlife, uh, but they made a novelization of one, two, three, five, and six. So I have all six of those novels because I think normally when you write a novel, a novelization of a movie, you're basing it off of like the early draft of the script. Um, rarely do you base it off the shooting draft. Uh, it depends. I mean, I guess it depends on the project, but um, you have to do it so far in advance that they're like, okay, we got to make sure it gets done. So they'll usually give you the first, like an earlier draft of the script before they start shooting um, or what, or right when they start shooting. So you might have things in your book and the novelization that's based off of a script that those scenes got cut from the movie. 
So I wanted to read them to see what happened to some of these characters because after this movie, they bring um, Carlos back and Mike Epps back, but they don't mention Angie at all in the third movie. And you're like, well, what the hell happened to the little girl? Like She was so important in the last movie, and now nothing. Well, they actually kill her in the book. In the third book, they start off uh, like uh, maybe like a couple months after this movie, and they have Alice. Uh, she's she, you know, she at the end of this movie, she's programmed by Umbrella because they hack into her brain, uh, like they do the Nemesis, and they hack into her, and she uh, she they tell her to kill Angie, and then she does kill Angie, and then that's why she decides to leave the group and walk away because she's like, I can't be trusted. And, you know, Carlos is like, no, it wasn't you. They programmed you. Like, they made you do this. And she's like, I don't care. I don't want to be turned and kill you guys next. And that's why she's on her own when the third movie starts. And I'm like, hey, there's character. There's actual character stuff. But God forbid they have Alice shoot a little girl in the movies (laughs) because she's supposed to be like this kick-ass action hero that everybody loves and has no flaws. And now, Grant, I think killing a child is definitely way too far to go for your character. But um, apparently that was in maybe a draft of the third movie because it's in the third book. Or maybe the th- writer of the third book did that themselves, which is really dark. And uh, and if I was the editor of, of that book, I'd call that writer and say, hey, are you okay? Because <laughs> to me, you could have just had Angie just die of natural causes. They ran out of antivirus and she had to die. Like that, that That's such a simple way to, and a tragic way for her to go. And maybe... And maybe she asked Alice to pull the trigger because she didn't want to turn into a zombie. And then maybe Alice didn't do it or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter because that's character stuff and God forbid any of that exists. So anyway, we just saw the worst uh, worst scene in ever where it's Alice is like, all right, we got to drop in on these soldiers. She could have just ran up and jump kicked them. Because the fact that she broke into the building, I guess, ran up the back stairs, got to the roof, set up a bungee, and ran down the side of a building just to get a jump on two guards is just the dumbest fucking thing in the world. Uh, So here we see Dr. Isaacs. Uh, We're going to get our uh, first look at him. And then you also see Major Tom with him. And and she's having flashbacks now of, of Nemesis being created from... Matt Addison, who was her friend in the first movie. And here comes Nemesis. So now, and again, like everyone just sneaks up on people. So now Alice, like, it's like they don't know how to wrap these movies up. They're just like, what do we do? So they have all these guards in bicycle gear, which makes no sense. I mean, I guess if you're going into a zombie apocalypse, you definitely don't want any skin exposed. So I can appreciate that. But seeing through a motorcycle helmet at night, it just seems stupid they could have at least made the visors super clear and not tinted um but hey they're stormtroopers they're soulless people that work for the umbrella it's like whatever um they should have put hunk in these movies there's actually a fight in one of the movies where Mila just fights like a random guy who knows martial arts i think it's in the sixth movie and i'm like you could have made that hunk like it doesn't i, I don't care if you make hunk asian or whatever like he could be japanese in the movie like, they never really show you who Hunk is in the games anyway. But I just thought that would have been cool if he just, like, took off his mask. and then. But he had a mask on the whole movie. It was Hunk. And his call sign on his shirt says Hunk. And then he takes the mask off. And it's, like, this martial art dude. And he fights. Like, I'm just like, hey, do something. Like, <laughs> like get, put in some characters. Um, so, yeah. So, now this guy, Major Tom, is like, Alice, fight, um, fight the nemesis or I'm going to kill these people. And then she tries to bluff and say, I don't care if you kill these people. So that forces Major Tom to shoot Angie's father right in front of Angie. So way to go, Alice. You can't even save people's lives. Uh, Alice is a terrible hero. I think in the sixth movie, she has super strength. And and I know she has super strength because she jumps off a building and doesn't become street pizza when she lands on the ground. Um... And yet, in the, in the sixth movie, she can't even hold on to Ruby Rose and prevent her from falling into a, a giant fan and get cut up. So Alice is the most inconsistent. She's weak when, when someone needs to die. But it's like, well, okay. but and, I, and again, like I said, I'm all for flaws for characters. But she literally just let well, had a little girl's dad get killed right in front of her. Like, 
and it was because of Alice trying to posture. Like, I don't care if they live or die. It's like, yeah, you, clearly you do. This guy knows you've been trying to save Angie. Like, he knows your plan and what was going on. Like, you trying to act like you don't have humanity. You just got an innocent man shot in front of his little girl. So uh, it just makes... Alice is a scumbag. She's just a, she's just kind of a scumbag. She's selfless, uh, selfish, uh, not selfless. I mean, she acts selfless at times when the script needs her to, but she's selfish. Um, and it's funny, in the sixth movie, they try to explain that she doesn't have memories because she's a clone. But I'm like, well, clones have memories, stupids. <laughs> they, don't, like, they don't know how clones work. Because in the previous movie, the fifth movie, there's a bunch of clones... And, uh, and all of them know what's going on. So it's like, and there's other Alice clones in the third movie and the fourth movie, and they know what's up. So, um, anyway, so, uh, this hand to hand combat fight with Nemesis is so stupid. Uh, it's totally Paul Anderson tapping into his Mortal Kombat days. And he's like, cause he made, uh, the first Mortal Kombat movie. So there's literally a line where the bad guy goes, uh, Major Tom says, finish, finish her, finish him. And you're just like, oh my God, dude. Like, remember what movie you're making, Paul W.S. Anderson. He can't. And then there's this scene where he, he wants to see who's tougher, Nemesis or Alice. And then Alice is actually starting to lose. But God forbid Alice lose, so he throws her a weapon to, like, help her. And you're like, well, what do you want? Do you want Alice to die and find out if Nemesis is tough? Like, if, do you want the strongest to survive? Or do you want Mila to survive? Or do you want Alice to survive? Like... <laughs> It's like the motivations and stuff are just all over the place. Like it, it, they show in flashbacks here that he helped create Nemesis and helped turn Alice, this Alice clone, into, you know, a superhuman. And now he wants to see what his two projects do when they fight each other. But now they flash back to Matt Addison uh, from the first movie, um, played by Eric Mabius, who I wish was in this movie. Eric Mabius is a good actor. <laughs> um, I wish he was just in this movie as Matt and not Nemesis or they spend the whole maybe he slowly transforms into Nemesis throughout the whole movie and you have some kind of fly Cronenberg tragedy thing going on um, but uh, yeah, whatever God forbid you tell a story <laughs> in these movies uh, the good thing is we're near the end now um, but anyway she, she's, she's realizing that he's Matt she's remembering and she apologized. She's like, I'm sorry, I'm hurting you. I, I know you're Matt. And I like that. There's, you know, I don't mind them making Nemesis Matt Addison, ultimately. Um, I still think it's lazy that he was just created there in Raccoon City. Because then again, later, that, that, um, that like enables the video game remake of 3 to do the same thing. And I'm like, oh, screw you, video game. Why can't Nemesis come from the Europe branch like he originally was mentioned in the original games? Um. He's like, you're not a mutation, you're evolution. And I can understand maybe why he wants Alice to live between the two. If I could play devil's advocate a little bit. She looks human. She doesn't look like a monster. They want to make superhumans. But then again, I'm like, do they? Or do they want to make like, or they, because like Umbrella has, there's no plan here. Like, like Paul Anderson has no idea how to write this company and their motivations because they change every movie and some movies the uh the red queen's helping alice and other movies she's not uh then there's a white queen but there's there's that was only in one movie um and then they, they just want to survive the apocalypse so they want to they know the world's going to end so as a as a way to control the population of earth they release a virus to mutate everyone and then their plan is to release an antivirus 10 years later um and then all the executives and all the rich people would wake up into a a world that's literally destroyed and none of them know how to probably pick up a hammer and nails and yet they're gonna come back and the world's wiped out like it's so destroyed it's such an awful plan there's it's so bad this these movies are so bad they're the most single-minded entity ever. It's just like, let's just make more monsters and we'll get rich off that somehow. It's like, you can make clones and you have cryotubes. Those are way more valuable to humanity than than anything else. And why do you care about money up and even into the fifth movie? They're showing that the Umbrella Corporation is still trying to make money off of like different things or, or they were. And you're like, but from who? The planet is destroyed now. Like, what are you trying to do? 
All right, so hey, Jill just shot somebody. Good. And the other characters are shooting people. All right, so now this is where it seems Umbrella is dropping a nuke on on uh, on you know on Raccoon City. Um. So yeah, I don't know. It's this is bad. This is all bad stuff. Um, in the in the video game, it was uh, the virus got so out of control that the U.S. government had no choice. They were like, if this goes further, we have you know it's going to be awful. So we have to send in a nuke. And you don't want them to, and, you know, they don't want to to an extent, but they have to. And that's when Jill and Barry have to get out of the city in the third game. Um, and then you find out in the sixth game that there's this company or this group of people called The Family. And they're like, they've been kind of in control. They're like a bunch of rich people that have kind of been in control of the United States uh, since like the turn of the century uh, of like the maybe the 18th or 19th century, like, er, you know, early on. Um and uh, and they've been funding umbrella in a lot of ways and they also have pull in the government and they told the government to nuke so it's like okay so that explains that a little bit uh, even though the sixth game sucks um so in this shot here you have Milla running across the side of the glass building um the building's getting shot by a helicopter that's stolen out of uh, a scene from the the four, uh, code veronica video game um and then this scene is here too where she sees three guards she drops her gun, and then before it hits the ground, she grabs it and shoots them. Um, that's also stolen from Claire Redfield from the Code Veronica opening scene in the video game. Um, but when you watch it in the context of the movie, it's not even that cool of a scene. I mean, her getting chased by a helicopter and shooting, that's, that looks kind of neat. But her dropping the gun, it's like, eh, I don't know. Again, Paul Anderson's all about that fan service and not really about anything and then here we have the helicopters oh and then some piece of debris comes and hits alice so there's an actual interesting background in that shot uh when the helicopters explode you can see almost like a um i don't know how to how to describe it it's 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 kind of gothic looking though uh there's like a building in the background it looks like it could be a church or or maybe it's a building that you could pass for the saint michael clock tower from the second game but instead they shoot in front of the city hall glass building which is so visually not interesting, in my opinion, um, compared to a gothic architecture of the the building across the street. So, that, but again, that's a personal preference, you know. Like Alexander Witt was probably like, "Oh, this glass building and this this U-shaped building looks really cool. Would be great to have in my in the movie." And it's like, eh, I don't know. Um, Um, so this is Alice has a, yeah, sorry, I went blank for a second there. I'm just kind of watching this scene. Um, so she grabs this bad guy and, and uh, major Tom and she throws him out of the helicopter just now. And he's like, killing me won't get you answers. And she's like, nah, but it's a start. Um, that is also lifted when they do the Resident Evil three remake. They, they copy that scene almost, almost exactly where Jill is aiming a gun at Nikolai. And he's like, if you kill me, you're not going to, you know, get the antidote or whatever. You're not going to find out the truth. And she's like, I don't care. And she shoots him. <laughs> or something along the lines happens like that, uh, where you have to just, like save Carlos and you shoot Nikolai instead. But he's like, you know, uh, I, I could have I could have helped. I could have provided answers. I could have given you something. And she's like, I don't care. So, yeah, the makers of the third video game definitely pulled stuff from this movie. And I think they pulled some of the worst stuff. But now you have uh, Ashford. He's a zombie. And he goes and grabs. So he gets his revenge in a way. I, I'm okay with poetic justice like that in a movie. Um so that doesn't bother me too much. And all these zombies come around Major Tom and kill him. And now Alice is flying away in a helicopter with her team. I guess they're going to let that pilot live. Oh, or maybe LJ's flying. No, he's not. There is a There are pilots. And I guess they've just been like, okay, we're leaving because there's a nuke coming. So we'll fly you guys out of here, I guess. Um, so anyway, we have a moment here where Alice is talking to... Um, Angie, Alice has been wounded in that battle. A piece of debris came and hit her. This shot's cool where it's like the nuke coming and the camera is like upside down and it f uh, follows over. That's pretty neat. Um, and then even the shot where it blows up that building. Now that building is a cool looking building to blow up. This like half circle building. Um, that's kind of neat looking. 
Uh, but if you notice, that's the only semicircular building like that in these shots. In the sixth movie, they find a building that's uh, a full circle, and uh, and they say it's a building that's still remaining in Raccoon City, which is no way because all those skyscrapers were just wiped out. Not an not an inch of them of the foundation would be left up. It would be just completely obliterated. But yet in the sixth movie, there's one circular building still standing, barely in the middle of the city, and everyone decides to camp out on it. I'm like, that's the most unstructurally sound building. Like, there's no way that building is is held, being held up. There's no way. I do like quiet scenes in a movie, and this movie is loud as shit for the whole movie, which I hate. Um, but the scene here where it's just like, you just hear the water, and they're in the Arclay Mountains, and they're at the the umbrella teams coming into the crashed helicopter site. Apparently, the others escaped, but Alice, for some reason, is for the first time not the one who got away. So they find her body in the wreckage, um, along with the pilots. Um, you see a woman in a business suit there. She looks like she could be Alexa Gioni, which would have been a cool thing if they put in a female villain in these movies. But no. Uh, you know, they, they kind of do that a little bit in the fifth movie with Jill, brainwash Jill and, and clone Michelle Rodriguez. But, um, but yeah, no, they don't do it. But, uh, but then they have Isaac's there and he finds Alice's body. She looks like she's dead. And then here you get the cleanup, which I kind of like this. They talk about the news and they're like, oh my God, there was a bomb, like, like a bomb went off or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they show how Umbrella covers it up by saying, oh, it wasn't a bomb going off. It was, um, a reactor you know, um, cause like the, the, the news reporter, they, they leak her tape to the press and say it was zombies and it was a virus, but then umbrella comes in, controls the media and says it was actually a nuclear reactor. Some people did get sick, but the nuclear reactor blew up and it wiped everyone out anyway. So that, uh, footage that you saw from, uh, that was leaked to you was actually a hoax. Um, it's not real and, uh, and trust us, we're umbrella. So they show like, news reports from Los Angeles and from like, you know, Fox and, you know, and, uh, and MSNBC and basically every piece of media outlet because they all lie. Um, and they show that. And I kind of like that. I'm like, Oh, umbrellas controlling the narrative. That happens a lot. Disney tries. They, they were a lot of companies were really good at controlling the narrative of them in the press, Warner brothers, uh, Disney until about five years ago when, when people who felt, felt mistreated and, you know, working for these companies started speaking up. Uh, and they had social media to speak up on. And uh, and so they used to be able to control the narrative. Nowadays, you can't really do that. But uh, but at this point in time, it was pretty common for companies to control the narrative. So here we have another naked Milijovich. For some reason, she has to be naked in these movies. Um, you know, she's a pretty lady and all, but these are Resident Evil movies. I don't need nudity in them. I really don't. Um but you have Dr. Isaacs here. He has her in a tube. They've been operating on her. And uh, and she, you know, it's funny. These They have, like, these scans of her body. And the, the boobs on the on the CG scans, like the, the, the computer rendering of her boobs, are, like, three cup sizes bigger. <laughs> and I'm not saying that as a negative. Like I said, she's super pretty. I mean, I definitely don't mind looking at Milijovic. But it's Resident Evil, and I just don't feel like nudity in these movies is necessary. Um, you know, the, the, the R rating should come from kind of the violence, the, the, the makeup of the zombies and creatures and, uh, and the death scenes, like that should be what pushes the, the R rating doing. Cause I heard they cut scenes like of her vagina and stuff. Like there's a vagina shot in the first movie you see for like a second and they, they have to cut that stuff out cause it would give them an NC 17 rating. I'm like, but yeah, but why is that in the movie? Why, why does but it's, oh, she's being operated on. She has to be naked to be operated on. I'm like, she doesn't need to be operated on. <laughs> you could cut these scenes. Um, you could just, you know, and they kind of do in the later movies. They have her being brainwashed in a room by Jill Valentine where she's like, well, I don't even remember if she's fully clothed in that or not. Or maybe she she's not and she gets clothed. Like, I don't know. So dumb. These movies are dumb. Um. So now he's giving her the pen and he's kind of seeing if she knows how to write. So it's kind of mimicking like 
the opening of this movie, she kind of wakes up and she doesn't really remember everything that happened at the mansion. And then over the course of the movie, she starts to remember. So it seems like they're going to repeat themselves. But oh no, Paul Anderson's going to subvert your expectations, and he's going to show, um, he's going to show you know something else. You know, he's going to he's going to have her remember everything, and she's going to remember who she is and everything. But that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to remember everything to think she's in control, because we're as we're going to find out. Uh, they have they use satellites to tap into her mind they put something in her brain and now she uh, she can be controlled at, at for certain amounts of time so here we have and when she's remembering they just it's like it's like this intense noise and you're just like this movie doesn't know how to they don't know how to do anything subtle in these fucking movies um yeah i just god but now she remembers that he was the other scientist along with Major Tom. Who is Major Tom, not Dr. Tom? This guy is actually Dr. Isaacs. Um, and it's funny because he's just kind of like... They call him Dr. Isaacs because uh, they couldn't... Um, I guess they couldn't get Jason Isaacs into the movie to play Birkin. So they decided to just... They were like, no, Jason Isaacs, he was Birkin. And in case we ever get to bring him into these movies as Birkin, we're going to save him. So we're going to name this guy Dr. Isaacs. But then because this actor then went from this to like Game of Thrones and became popular in Game of Thrones, they were like, hey, let's bring him back for the the sixth movie. So he's in the third movie. He's the main villain in the next movie. But because he became a name like Michelle Rodriguez did and, uh, and you know, and everything, they bring those actors back. And it's like, but you don't need them. Like you could have introduced Oswald E. Spencer in the sixth movie. You could have actually done stuff that you know matters and ties into the games, but Paul Anderson just he says he cares and he says he's a fan, but but he just picks the weirdest things to be like, oh, I'm a fan, so that's why this is in the movie, and it's like, okay, but then why is why aren't these things also in the movie? If you're such a fan, anyway. So Alice now is she can literally explode heads like scanners, and yet all these guards show up and she's like. She's staring at all of them, but her friends show up to help her. And I'm like, she can kill all of these guys with a thought. And then there he says he got level six authorization, which is what Ashford was. Um, but I think there is one level higher, level seven, which is where the real Dr. Isaacs, because as we're going to find out later, this Isaacs is a clone. Um, but like uh, the, like him and uh, Alicia Marcus, uh, who is Alice's real name, and we're going to find out in the last movie, She's their level seven because they're cryostasis. So all level seven people are in cryo right now. And how that building, how the hive survived a nuclear explosion is just the dumbest thing. I'm like, why would you go, okay, we're going to build our cryo lab under Raccoon City, release the virus here in Raccoon City, even though we have other facilities around the world we can do it too. And then we're going to nuke Raccoon City. And it's like, and then we're going to awaken 10 years later and just. You know, everything will be dead. All the zombies and virus monsters will be dead. But so will the planet because the T-virus apparently kills plants and water. But yet in the fourth movie, they bring water back because <laughs> there's a boat in the fourth movie. After they say in the third movie that the water's been wiped out and all the oceans dried up. It's so bad. These movies are so fucking bad. And then we have this scene here where they're like, uh, Project Alice, activate. Um, so now she's they can see through her eyes anytime she's under a satellite. So now they have a mole inside the resistance, even though the res like the rebellion or whatever is just Jill and Oded Fair and Angie and Mike Epps. And you're just like, who cares? And then Umbrella covered up the outbreak. But then in the third movie, it takes place five years later and the world has gone to shit and oceans have dried up and plants have dried up. And zombies have taken over and there's like maybe like 20,000 people left on the planet. And you're like, well, this movie doesn't show that. This movie doesn't set that up. This movie set up that the world's going to go back to normal like the video games do. The video games never go post-apocalyptic. The third movie goes so far post-apocalyptic, it's insane. So we'll talk about that in the third movie. We end on the satellite shot there and we get this, I think, Mudvayne song or something. So I'll talk through the credits. Uh, we're at the hour and 33 minute marker. I don't know how long this movie is. I'm guess, I mean, I guess it's an hour and a half, obviously. But, um, 
but hopefully this synced up properly because I know sometimes when I record long audio bouts for podcasts or for commentaries like we did with Venom I think uh, there's like a certain part like the 40 or 50 minute marker where like a couple seconds of my audio was like I don't know lost and so it so the last half of my audio commentary doesn't fully sync up with the movie so hopefully that doesn't happen here but if it did I'm sorry at least you can maybe still listen to this as a podcast and hear me rant about this terrible terrible movie called Resident Evil Apocalypse I do like the soundtrack this distance this disillusion <laughs> I cling to memories while falling yeah I think this is Mudvayne I think um, but this has a good soundtrack overall. The, the first uh, two movies, I think, have a soundtrack. I think the th third and fourth one, maybe the third one had a soundtrack too. I can't remember. I know the first two, though, had a soundtrack with bands on it, like actual bands. And uh, like Il Nino like was in the first one. Um, and uh, Depeche Mode was actually, they did a cover song of Dirt, which is an Iggy Pop song. Oh, then there's a, a mid credit scene where they talk about the Umbrella Corporation. Um, I think in the first movie, if you stick through the credits at the very end, you can hear Michelle Rodriguez say, um, uh, after this, I'm going to get laid or something like that. Or tonight, I'm going to get laid or something, something like that. Terry Morales, that was the name of the weather lady. I'm sorry, I missed her name. They call the guy Major Kane in the credits. They didn't. I guess they were too embarrassed to put Major Tom in there, but that's who he plays, Major Tom Kane. Um Again, it's just like the references Paul Anderson makes in his scripts are just terrible. Like They're just so terrible. I'm going to call this guy Major Tom. Get it? Because the song, Major Tom to Ground Control. It's a great song, but it's a dumb name for a character. Like, unless you're doing it in a schlocky movie. But this movie, like, it tries to take itself so seriously. It's like, this movie's so bad. Like, if they would have added some humor to this movie, like a little bit more than just Mike Epps, you know, that's the only thing like it's like oh hey it's mike epps so let's have him be the funny black guy and it's like ah in the in the third movie they he's not that he's not like the comic relief in the third movie and i kind of i kind of like that it's like not a stereotype but in this movie they're just like i don't know think he's kind of a little bit of a, a stereotype in a way and it's that's not always good to do in movies um but he is charismatic as shit so i like watching him and he's in these movies Especially this one. And the next one, he's kind of a dumb character because he gets bit and he knows what that means. But yet he still tries to have sex, you know, and you're just like with a, with a, a Shanti or some singer is in the third movie. But it just, uh, you're like, come on, dude, you know better than that. You know you're going to die. Um, but whatever. But uh, yeah, the soundtracks for these movies are good. I think the fourth one is, a, is just a score. The third, I think the third and fourth one have scores. You guys can correct me. The third one might have an actual soundtrack. The fourth movie has one song on it. It's by A Perfect Circle, and it's a remix. It's uh, it's um, the Outsider remix of, uh, and I'm uh, yeah, the Outsider. The name of the song is called The Outsider, and it's a remix version of it um, by Ren Holder. Maybe I can't remember. Um, but uh, the anyway, that was the only song featured in the movie. But the uh, the actual movie is just a, a score by uh, Tom and Andy. The first movie had a score, had four tracks scored by Marilyn Manson and Marco Beltrami. And I thought that worked. Actually, I really liked the... I love that. Like, that's actually a really great theme, if I, if I do say so myself. I really dig the sound of it. Um, but then when they get into, like, the... Dun -dun 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 -dun, and I'm like, eh, okay, I don't like that. But the main theme of Resident Evil 1, the movie, I liked a lot. She's the only one that makes me so. Uh, all these uh, scream metal bands on the soundtrack. Um, is this Slipknot? I can't remember. Sounds a little bit like the singer, Corey. Breathing and more. Yeah. When I see her, it's the worst. It's astounding. 
now or never she's coming home forever Law. so double negative does the visual effects for this i think that's dneg i think that might be what they're called now or there's another company called dneg that did um or ndeg or something like that i can't remember they did venom visual effects one of the companies that worked on the visual effects for venom Hard to say what got my attention. Vexed and craze, eight bad attraction. Got my name on my face. Yeah, I think this is Slipknot. Such a pheromone cult. I think that's the lyrics. All right, so yeah, we got um, Ella's Lonely Friends Band. We got, uh, dang, Cradle of Filth on there. Slipknot, yeah, this is Vermilion. And uh, Kill Switch Engage, I think, was the previous song. I don't think it was Mudvayne. I think it was Kill Switch Engage. Um, so, yeah, that's the credits, and that's the uh, nearing the end of the movie now. So thank you guys for listening to this. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you've seen Resident Evil Apocalypse, what you think of it, now you've heard my thoughts. We'll do, maybe in like a month, we'll do Resident Evil Extinction and Afterlife. Maybe I'll watch them back-to-back -back and, and try to record them both in the same day. Um, uh, Afterlife, I think I'll actually have fun talking about, even though I think it's a terrible movie. But it's like a bad movie in the way like Batman and Robin is bad, I feel. Like I can watch it and be like, eh, okay, it's bad, but there's enough in here to where I like I, I find some some value. That there's, there's some fan moments in there that I think are neat. Plus, that's when we get our first like full Wesker, and he's like superhuman, and I'm a big Wesker fan. And the guy does a serviceable job for that movie at least. Like he, you know, he's not the the he does the best he can with what he got you know has because they don't really write Wesker as a good character like a interesting character like he is in the games there's like there's more to him in the games in in the movies he's just I don't know he's like the leader at one point and then he's not the leader and then he's like second in command and he, and he's like he's a wants to help Alice and he doesn't want to help Alice and he's like these movies are so terrible um but we're gonna talk about all of them eventually so thanks for listening to another episode of Nemeseek. Um, this should hopefully be around episode 15 or 16 now uh, by the time this goes up. And we have Resident Evil 8 uh, stuff that's going to come out this weekend from Tokyo Game Show. And so, you know, I'll make some more Nemesis videos next week after we get whatever information comes out from Tokyo Game Show. I'm sadly working all weekend. And then today I got to take Echo to the vet. Um, we got uh, an appointment that I moved up uh, so I could, you know, get him taken care of, which sucks because now I lost a day of work. Uh, I was actually, it's like 10 in the morning right now. I woke up at 8 a.m. to walk Echo and do this because we have an appointment is at noon so uh so i'm gonna go and uh you know rest for a little bit and maybe edit this and get this ready for you guys and i'll post this very soon probably even later today on the channel and um and yeah i mean like i'm, I'm just you know i'm gonna have fun going through a lot of these movies but the sixth movie is definitely gonna be the one that i i like five and six i'm gonna rip the shit out of those movies those movies are so fucking bad uh so i know i, I cursed a lot in this one i can't help but these movies bring it out of me i hate them so much um and uh, and i will but but this one like one two and three and four i dislike strongly but hate is a strong word and i think i only really use it uh properly when i'm talking about the fifth and sixth movies so we'll get there eventually so you guys let me know what you think of apocalypse and some of the other resident evil movies down below in the comment section and we'll talk more about them down there if you want uh thank you so much for watching the show or listening to the show as always um, i'll definitely come back and do more of these very very soon thanks so much see you in the future peace